Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, welcome. My name is Sarah Carr. I'm the Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, which stands for Open Communications for the Ocean. And we're particularly pleased, we're well, pleased to welcome all of you here today. We're particularly pleased to welcome Julian Clifton from the University of Lincoln, who will be presenting. Um, he's going to be speaking about designing and delivering carbon and biodiversity credit schemes to benefit MPA managers, indigenous peoples, and local communities. Before I turn things over to Julian, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, we'll have the pres Julian will present and then we'll we'll have the remaining time for questions. Um, there's two ways you can send in questions. There's a question uh, button in your user interface and you can put it in there. And in that case, um, before it's, it's um, I, I will see it, and it's it's a little easier for me to moderate those questions too. So I, I do like to use those. Uh, but you can also post the question in the chat. Now, um, with the chat, um, everyone can you can choose the option to have everyone see it, and um, you're welcome to put questions and responses to other people's questions in the chat. Um, and you're welcome to post um, other information that is relevant to the topic in the chat to share experiences that you've had, other resources that you know of, um, thoughts on what Julian is presenting about. Um, you're welcome to do that. We ask that you keep a professional, however, and on the topic. Um, but that is an option for everyone as well. And you can choose whether just I see it or Julian and I can see it or everyone in the in the webinar can see it. So anyway, given all, all that, we'll, we'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Julian now. Thank you so much for being with us today, Julian. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. And thanks for coming in and listening to the webinar today. Um, Sarah said the focus here is on carbon and biodiversity credit schemes and how they can play a role in marine protected area management, particularly looking at the implications for stakeholders, uh, indigenous peoples and local communities in particular. I'll spend about 35, 40 minutes um, going through the presentation here and then obviously we'll um, be able to answer some questions and comments. Sorry, <laughs> we'll get there. So just as a brief outline for the webinar, I'll firstly introduce the, the context here, talk about what carbon and biodiversity credits uh, are, the evolution of, of the markets in both of these areas, and relate that to broader issues regarding global treaties, conventions, and initiatives, both to address climate change and uh, biodiversity loss. And then I'll contextualize this more closely by looking at how these credit schemes um, are of relevance to the marine environment in particular, both carbon and biodiversity credits, and then focus on three issues relating to how we can view the integration of these schemes into marine protected areas and MPA management. Firstly, with, with respect to considering issues of resource ownership and tenure rights within MPAs, Secondly, with regards to issues relating to the distribution of the financial benefits arising from credit sales with respect to local communities. And finally, thinking about some of the implications of carbon and biodiversity credits for longer term MPA management. So just some brief definitions and apologies if um, I'm stating the obvious here to some people, I'm sure I am. Essentially, uh, a carbon credit first, this is what we'll look at first, and then we'll think about the biodiversity credits and biodiversity credit markets secondly. Carbon credits are one ton of carbon dioxide equivalents, so other greenhouse gases are included, that can be bought and sold. And we commonly refer to carbon credits being traded in the compliance market through long established international programs 
um, as part of obviously um, UNFCC commitments related to greenhouse gas emission reductions. And in the current context, we think about how carbon credits can help meet national commitments or NDICs as part of the Paris Agreement, obviously attempting to um, constrain global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees C above pre-industrial levels. Now, carbon credits can also be traded in what we call a voluntary carbon market. And what we're talking about here is where companies, so the corporate sector, may seek to voluntarily offset their carbon emissions. Um, these may be more correctly referred to as, as carbon offsets. And there are many motives why a, a company may seek to engage in voluntary carbon trading. It is of interest to, to note that in the past 18 months, 24 months, there has been increasing pressure on companies to engage in this process through initiatives such as the Science-Based Targets for Nature and Task Force for Nature Disclosure. And there are others at the European level as well, which are attempting to place increasing pressure on corporates to take responsibility uh, for their emissions. I should say, as I go through each slide, you will see some references at, at, the, at the bottom. Um, Sarah has a copy of this presentation, so you can follow up any of the issues that I'm mentioning by taking a look at some of the references that, that, I, that I use. Now, if we think about the compliance market, so the, the Paris Agreement trading of carbon credits with respect to the voluntary market, clearly the international compliance market is, is much, much larger. However, there has been significant growth in the voluntary carbon market, as you can see from the two, two images here. And projections vary naturally, but the, all, the indica all the indications are that this will con the size of the voluntary market will continue to increase. In terms of the, the, uh, the language that's used regarding voluntary carbon market, Carbon credits may be generated through two main mechanisms, so two types of credit schemes, effectively. Firstly, emissions avoidance, where a project is established which enhances protection of carbon sinks to enable more carbon to be sequestered uh, from the atmosphere. So we can imagine here where we're thinking about a program which may enhance MPA management or, or tropical forest management and so on. Or we can talk about projects related that are termed emissions removal, where we're thinking here about new carbon sinks are being created to sequester more carbon from the atmosphere through, obviously, afforestation and, and so on. Biodiversity credits are a logical progression from carbon credits. They are different in many respects, but the logic that you can, you can quantify and uh, uh, monetize the trading of carbon and biodiversity is, is a natural step in logic. And attention towards developing a biodiversity credit market has been given significant recent impetus by Convention on Biological Diversity, the Kunming Protocol, with its reference to protecting 30% of um, natural ecosystems by the year 2030 and so on. And this general language about nature positivity and so on. Just quickly comparing biodiversity credits with carbon credits, we do see some key points of difference. A carbon credit is very easily measured. Um, obviously, it's one ton of CO2 equivalent. Biodiversity can be measured in innumerable ways. So there is no single metric for biodiversity that can be used to quantify biodiversity credits. That may or may not be an issue, depending on, on your perspective. But it is obviously an area of concern because we find it difficult to maintain equivalence between projects which are measuring biodiversity in different ways. It's unlikely we will reach a single universally accepted metric. Maybe that's not needed, though, given the broad range of biodiversity credits that could be generated. The second point of difference relates to tradability. Um, with respect to the carbon credits market, there is um, frequent trading, buying and selling and on-selling of carbon credits between different entities. With regards to biodiversity, the emphasis is on 
retiring credits. So if a biodiversity credit or a gain in biodiversity is generated, then obviously the objective is that that credit is then retired. It is not sold on in order to maintain and enhance biodiversity. And finally, the focus on biodiversity credit projects tends to be smaller scale um, than with respect to carbon credits. There is a lot more we could talk about in comparing these two markets, but that gives you the hopefully an idea as to the, the major points of, of difference. With respect to biodiversity credit schemes, there are, this is very much in its early stages. As I mentioned, the carbon, the generation and sale of carbon credits has a long history, um, checkered history, uh, admittedly, but a long history. Biodiversity credits are a more recent initiative. And this graphic here gives you an idea of where currently biodiversity credit schemes are in operation. So both in developed and, and developing world. Finally, with respect to this introductory section, we should remember that carbon and biodiversity credits can be sold together in different ways. And we have three uh, approaches here, stacking, bundling, and stapling. I know there's a lot of terminology. This is the last one. So stacking is where credits are sold separately. So if you if you have, for example, an afforestation project, you might sell the carbon credits generated separately from the biodiversity credits with obviously a risk of double counting. Alternatively, you may bundle them. Uh, so you sell the carbon and the biodiversity credits generated through a project as one unit. And that is of particular significance in a marine context. For example, if we're thinking of coral reefs where there's very limited carbon storage potential, but obviously high biodiversity. So that's an advantage in the sense of developing credit schemes in, in a coral reef ecosystem. Finally, um, carbon credits sorry, biodiversity credits can be stapled onto carbon credits. So carbon credits can be labeled as nature positive. So they have an additional biodiversity co-benefit. So overall, we're talking here about what are collectively referred to as nature-based solutions. So carbon credits and biodiversity credits are termed in, in this way. And that obviously reflects the interlinked global issues relating to both climate change and biodiversity loss. It goes without saying that there is a lot of actors involved in the process of credit, both carbon and biodiversity, generation, sale, monitoring, and so on. And this graphic gives you some idea of the range of organizations. So if we start down at the bottom left, we have investors who put the money up for a project to be developed. The projects may be developed by governments, NGOs, or companies. The credits that are generated through that project are then verified by ideally third party auditors. And then the credit itself is, is generated, logged, and registered by some key leading companies. Vera uh, is one example of, of this. So they are the um, ultimate organization that stores and sells the credits that are generated. So we have a new ecosystem going on here of a range of different sectors. We can imagine obviously corporate interests, financial interests, NGOs, governments coming together in new ways and new interactions being generated through the expanding marketing, both carbon, voluntary carbon and biodiversity credits. So why is this of interest to marine ecosystems and what should we be considering uh, in this context? Obviously, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these figures and these arguments I'm going to make now, particularly with regard to um, carbon credits, marine ecosystems have an un paralleled potential to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. So if we compare the potential sequestration rate observed in mangroves and salt marshes and to a lesser extent seagrasses, we still see they outweigh by orders of magnitude 
the potential carbon sequestration, sequestration, words are difficult, rates associated with terrestrial ecosystems, temperate, boreal, and tropical forests. So potentially marine ecosystems can make, play a much greater role in carbon sequestration, which adds to the interest in carbon credits associated with managing and conserving marine ecosystems. There are a number of reasons for the different rates of sequestration. Firstly, particularly with regard to, to mangroves, most of the carbon is actually stored subsurface in, in deep sediments rather than the biomass, which obviously increases the total potential carbon storage. With regards to kelp and seaweed, the rapid growth of, of in, in these ecosystems contributes towards their significant carbon storage potential, even if as yet we don't have much data on potential storage rates. So if we put the potential carbon storage argument together with the obvious biodiversity benefits associated with conserving marine ecosystems, we get a very strong argument for nature-based solutions to be operated and implemented in a marine context. And that is not obviously not to mention the other ecosystem services that could be um, sustained and enhanced through effective management, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. I don't need to recap those. So it's clear that the marine the sorry marine environments have a significant role to play. As yet, there is little data on the potential um, storage associated with different marine ecosystems. But recently, there was an interesting survey that carried out by UNESCO, who surveyed the carbon storage potential of 50 marine world heritage sites, principally focusing here on seagrasses, tidal marshes and, and mangroves. So the estimates here, and this is only 50 um, World Heritage Sites, indicated that the total carbon storage potential was equivalent to about 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And there were certain ecosystems that are pretty obviously the leading uh, contributors towards that total storage. So obviously eco large, complex ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef, the Everglades and the St. Darbans would contribute to a large potent, a large, make a large contribution, sorry, to that total carbon storage potential. So although we don't have data relating to individual MPAs on any systematic level, it's clear that marine ecosystems can make a significant contribution towards carbon storage, uh, carbon sequestration. And if we then think about the, the financial aspects associated with, again, in, in a marine context, we can envisage that MPAs can, can generate long-term sustainable finance streams through the generation of both carbon and biodiversity credits. And there is a demand for such credits worldwide. Estimates vary again, but there is most there is a consensus that high quality so-called blue carbon credits, so carbon credits derived from marine ecosystems that have a high degree of perhaps of uh, verification associated with them, so they're reliable and they are real carbon savings, could approach ten billion dollars, and that's that's approximately by the year 2040 or, or 2050. Although there are very few, as yet, blue carbon schemes operating worldwide. And another point of interest here is that if we're thinking about both carbon and biodiversity credits, those schemes can operate both in pristine and degraded mar marine ecosystems. So emissions avoidance, that is enhanced protection so emissions avoidance in terms of carbon emissions involves enhanced protection. And that would clearly be more applicable to relatively pristine or well-managed MPAs. But equally, MPAs which are in need of restoration and rehabilitation 
can contribute towards emissions removal. So we're seeing a potential finance stream that is not constrained to high quality MPAs. So let's start thinking about some of the issues that are associated with both carbon and biodiversity credit schemes that could operate in a, a marine context and how that relate, how these issues may relate to, to MPA management. Firstly, we need to think about, well, we can think about many things. We'll think about three. One thing I would like to discuss is the issue of ownership and, and tenure rights. Now, we've been talking here about the generation of, of new markets, new money through carbon and biodiversity credit schemes. So the question immediately is, well, who should receive the financial benefits arising from the sale of these credits? Theoretically, where resources are under private ownership, which is you know, more, more commonly the case in a, a terrestrial context, for example, but where resources are under private ownership, the individual's right to the benefits from both carbon and biodiversity credits are relatively clear. Where the resources are under some form of collective ownership, for example, at the community or, or, or village level, again, the rights to benefits can be relatively easily identified on that collective basis. Where resources may be under state ownership, concessions may be may be operated. So concessions to either individuals, communities, or even private sector interests may be, de, may be, in, may be implemented, which allow the allocation on sh and sharing of financial benefits arising from the sale of carbon and biodiversity credits. That's in theory. Clearly, we all know in a marine context, issues of ownership and tenure rights are often unclear sorry are often unclear and very frequently contested so where we have individual claims to ownership in intertidal and subtidal environments those claims may may or may not have legal status depending on on the context similarly with respect to indigenous peoples and local indigenous uh, communities, indigenous peoples, where there are rights both um, already declared or potential associated with ownership in marine environments, again, they may or may not have legal status, very much depending on, again, the political context and relationship in terms of indigenous land and, and tenure claims. Equally, the Marine Park Authority may have some degree of ownership and tenure of maritime ecosystems. And those rights may or may not coexist or conflict with the rights declared or extant to, to other users. Similarly, the state, whether it's local, um, provincial or, sorry, local, regional or national, levels of government may have expressed or declared rights of ownership and jurisdiction. And they, again, may overlap internally, as is often the case, or perhaps conflict with others where international boundaries may uh, overlap. So with respect to marine environments, clearly there are complex issues associated with the identification and resolving of conflicts of ownership and tenure which have to be addressed if the benefits associated with carbon and biodiversity credit schemes are going to be allocated fairly. So those agreements are needed, firstly in relation to the ownership of carbon and biodiversity rights, and also the transfer of rights which are necessary for a credit scheme to operate. And I don't want to get into the intricacies of that particular point, but where you have a private company being involved in the financing and generation of carbon and biodiversity credits, that involves some transfer of rights associated with, with, the, with the resource 
from which the carbon and biodiversity originate. So there is complex, there's legal complexities, particularly in, in that um, uh, area. In subtitle environments, those issues could be resolved. Um, where we think about cases of offshore oil and gas exploration, the common procedure is for the state to lease rights to private companies to enable them to exploit oil and gas resources. You can imagine a similar process could operate with regards to subtidal environments where carbon and biodiversity credits are being generated. So rights to those benefits could be leased from the state to individuals or other organizations. In an instidal context, it's probably a bit more complicated because of the nature of overlapping and probably contested user claims, particularly involving indigenous groups. So we have a, a range of issues which would need to be addressed that would obviously vary according to the local political context there. And that can also be further complicated if, as in some countries, um, the national government asserts ownership over carbon, principally carbon credits, as part of their national goal or commitments and targets to achieve um, emission reductions consistent with Paris Agreement commitments. So this has happened in some countries where carbon credit schemes are operating or have been attempted to be implemented in intertidal areas, but have run up against problems because the state government asserts ownership over the carbon credits that are generated. And you see there's a, a wide range of potential avenues for uh, conflict here associated with ownership and, and tenure, which highlights the role, I think, of MPA managers. MPA managers, marine protected area authorities and, and management associations are well versed and practiced in resolving issues of ownership and tenure. That's inherent and implicit in most MPAs worldwide. They can also, in theory, help identify priority areas for different types of credit schemes, depending obviously upon the um, availability of environmental data. Clearly an MPA authority may be in a position to identify prime sites for perhaps um, carbon storage or biodiversity credits to be generated. And because of the um, official status of marine protected authorities and the, the linkages that they enjoy between government and communities, they can act as a broker in this process. So liaising between local communities, indigenous peoples, individual owners of resources, alongside the external project developers who may wish to finance carbon and bird carbon and biodiversity credit schemes, as well as various state authorities. And again, MPA authorities and managers are well practiced in longer term monitoring and evaluation um, procedures, which are necessary, obviously an essential part of any carbon or biodiversity credit scheme. The second point relates to issues of equity and justice. And what we're talking about here is the distribution of the, the financial or economic proceeds of credit sales back to local communities. So just to give an example of the, the complexities that may be involved here, the actual price of a carbon credit and the biodiversity credit varies principally according in the biodiversity credit world to the scheme that is used to measure biodiversity. One of the more common indices of biodiversity used in credit schemes is the, um, the Wallacea Trust methodology, which I don't have time to go into, but involves a basket of selected biodiversity metrics, similar to a similar idea to the retail price index, which we use to compare uh, economic development across countries. So five biodiversity indicators are identified and selected and used as the basis to measure biodiversity gain or loss associated with a credit scheme. And a biodiversity credit is, is defined as a 1% increase in that biodiversity. And that is allocated a, a economic value, in this case, $5. There are many, many other credit schemes 
probably about 15 or 20. Uh, I've given you a couple of references at the bottom there, which can get you into that particular area in more detail if you wish. Operating different methodologies and clearly a variable credit price. Interestingly, the different credit biodiversity credit schemes operate different criteria when it relates to how much of the sale of a biodiversity credit goes back to local communities. Generally, there is a relatively high proportion. So where the information is available within the different methodologies that are used in biodiversity credits, it can be anywhere between 50 or 90% of the value of biodiversity credit sales is guaranteed to flow back to what are broadly called local communities. In addition, some biodiversity credit schemes have requirements which restrict the on-selling of, of credits. And that harks back to the point I made earlier about the need to retire biodiversity credits and not use them as a means to generate profits through reselling and on-selling. The benefits that arise from the sales of both carbon and biodiversity credits can be, can be monetary, they can be cash, they could be vouchers or they could be credits, or they may be in-kind benefits. So they could be the provision of services, health, education, infrastructure, etc., which are financed through the sales of credits. The benefits may be um, packaged individually or collectively. So individuals may receive the financial proceeds of credit sales, or they may be distributed collectively. And that obviously will refer, will reflect, sorry, patterns of resource ownership and tenure. The benefits, financial benefits may be delivered upfront at the start of a, a project, throughout the project or on completion. Again, the details vary across different schemes. Clearly, it is essential to design appropriate mechanisms to deliver the benefits to appropriate recipients in correct ways. I'll elaborate on what I mean there in a second. Because when we are thinking about a new revenue stream, such as that generated from carbon or biodiversity credits, there has to be appropriate mechanisms to ensure that the funds reach a broad cross-section within the communities and that no or any potential misallocation or misuse of those funds is, is minimized as, as far as possible. And it's also important to consider that by the very nature of carbon and biodiversity credit schemes, these new sources of revenue within MPAs may be significant in those MPAs which have been, for whatever reason, unable to generate other income streams through tourism or, or whatever it might be. So where there are all, few alternative sources of finance available to communities in perhaps more, more remote MPAs, then there is clearly a role, a potential role, for carbon and biodiversity credits, the sales of those credits, to be a significant new income stream. There's a, there should be, I was going to say there has been a lot of work, there should be a lot more work done in this area, I, I feel, because there are broad principles that are commonly accepted relating to equity and justice, uh, which we could all agree on. However, equity and justice are very conceptual. They have different dimensions and they are interpreted in different ways. So just for example, if I was uh, developing a credit scheme, I might be interested in making sure that the sales of those credits went to people within communities who were actively involved in the credit scheme, whatever activities they may be, restoration and, and, and so on. And that would be 
a distributive justice on the basis of merit. Or I may say, actually, I would want to make sure that the credit, the economic benefits from my credit sales go to those in most need of extra finance. That would be a different interpretation of distributive justice or distributive equity. Equally, I may say at the outset, we have to have equal participation in a carbon or biodiversity credit scheme. And therefore, I will be pursuing a policy of ensuring procedural justice to make sure that everyone was able to participate equitably in the design and operation of a credit scheme. So although we have these commonly agreed principles, the interpretation is very much context specific. There are other fundamental principles which would need to be observed in any credit scheme, principally full prior informed consent, which as a, a common tenet should apply to schemes in, in all circumstances. So we have these broad uh, con concepts over what is right and what is correct and what is appropriate. The interpretation of those will vary according to context, but again, MPA managers have the experience and knowledge of working with resident communities in resource management and can play a crucial role in helping to identify appropriate interpretations of equity, justice, FPIC, and so on. Because we are, again, I'm just repeating myself, but we are talking about new income streams that are being proposed as a part of any carbon or biodiversity credit scheme. And those involve new relationships, new relationships with resource owners, resource users, sorry, resource users, and private sector partners who might be funding the, the credit scheme in the first place. So that needs, necessitates very, very careful and sensitive approaches to what is appropriate participation. What is the appropriate interpretation of equity and justice in a credit scheme? And very close attention to these uh, concepts to ensure that the scheme which is designed and implemented reflects that local context. And I'm working currently on an aspect of this, which I am calling at the moment a, a fair benefit standard, which can be applied to new biodiversity and carbon credit schemes to apply principles related to equity, justice, consent, et cetera, to provide certainty to potential credit purchasers that the scheme operates according to these universally recognized principles. And finally, there is the question of how carbon and biodiversity credit schemes can assist management over the longer term. When we are thinking about carbon sequestration and biodiversity enhancement, we're thinking long time scales. You know, these, if we are considering how to uh, rehabilitate a degraded marine ecosystem, that will take place over decades. So the biodiversity or carbon gains associated with those projects operate over decades, a minimum of 30 years. They also, sorry, the schemes also involve regular monitoring. Regular monitoring is essential to ensure that a carbon or biodiversity, biodiversity credit scheme is, is doing what it should, is generating the appropriate benefits, and the credits arising from the scheme can be sold at regular intervals. So a carbon or biodiversity credit scheme in the marine context generates income over a prolonged period of time and is relatively predictable. And depending on how the scheme operates, there might be a frequent recurrence of intervals where finance is generated. So perhaps if we have a scheme which operates, say, for 30 years, there might be a five year monitoring uh, frequency associated with that which means that credits are generated and sold every five years. So there's a regular source of income. And if we think about that as a potential source of income related to the other 
sources of revenues, potential sources of revenues for MPAs. Clearly, government grants, ecotourism related activities, projects to fund alternative livelihoods, they're all very unpredictable. They're clearly vulnerable to external influences, mainly politics, and they're episodic. And I think credit schemes clearly offer a, a potential for longer term investment and financing, financing strategies because they are built around this long term generation of benefits with finance being generated at regular intervals throughout the project life cycle. And that offers really exciting opportunities to enable funding to address environmental issues, community development issues, or whatever the issues are within a specific MPA. And with those regular, oh, sorry, with the necessity for regular monitoring, there are additional employment opportunities available here, which could target marginalized groups, for example. Again, diversifying livelihoods, which we're all familiar with, but again, offering new employment opportunities if, if they are managed correctly. So just to bring this to a conclusion, I really like this paper that came out earlier this, this year in Ocean Sustainability, which is a, um, freely, freely accessible. We're talking about how can marine spatial planning be, be climate smart? We're all very interested in these sorts of things. The foundational principle number one at the top left there talks about prioritizing ecosystem health as a strategy for marine spatial planning. So marine spatial planning must sustain the ecosystems on which it depends. And I feel carbon and biodiversity credits are part of that foundational principle. They are climate smart. They are generating benefits for ecosystems and they can be integrated into marine spatial planning. Secondly, all the industry forecasts point to increased demand and continued demand for both carbon and biodiversity credits, but principally blue carbon, given its sequestration potential of marine ecosystems, biodiversity credits, given the attention being, um, being directed towards um, biodiversity conservation and, crucially, generating new sources of revenue to fund biodiversity conservation and credits which are of high integrity. So integrity there relates to they are actually generating a carbon saving or a biodiversity um, gain. And they are also designed in line with community needs desires and expectations. And MPAs offer the, the necessary institutional framework where carbon and biodiversity credits can be developed, where local communities, particularly indigenous peoples and local communities or IPLCs, can work with the external investors and project developers to generate what could be a sustained flow of finance and benefits, both to resident communities, user communities, and to conservation managers. This sounds very optimistic, and maybe it is, but there would be a few things needed, I think, for this to happen. And this is, the first of these is very loudly and repeatedly said at conferences on both carbon and biodiversity credits. We need government regulations. We need governments to introduce requirements forcing or incentivizing the private sector to invest in biodiversity alongside carbon credits. Yes, there are voluntary initiatives, science-based targets for nature, for example, but they are voluntary. If governments would introduce regulations the forcing companies down this line, we would see a lot more corporate activity and funding. There would be also a necessity for innovation and a lot of goodwill to clarify the inevitable contested claims over rights to carbon and biodiversity benefits. And I think we've, we've outlined that already. And finally, 
an effective external independent auditing of all credit schemes to make sure that they are built around principles of equity, justice, and others for the rights holders. Rights holders being the people who have the right to use, to benefit from the carbon and biodiversity credit schemes that may be operating in, in their communities, specifically relating to indigenous peoples and local communities. And there is a lot of attention being given to this at various international levels to make sure that credit schemes are based around these foundational principles. We all know that without community goodwill, participation and buy-in, conservation will not work. This is again, a necessary part of both carbon and biodiversity credit schemes for, for that reason alone. And that brings me to the end. So thank you very much for, for listening. And we've got at least 50 minutes or so, I think, for questions. So I will now stop talking. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Julian. That was fantastic. I um, appreciated the, the, the slow roll in intro and then all the information throughout. Um, I, we have lots of great questions already. Uh, if you are interested in sending in more, please do. You can do that through the chat function or through the question. We may not be able to get, in fact, we will not be able to get to all the questions, I suspect. Um, but Julian will see them, um, if you do send it in. So, so don't be shy about still sending them in. Um, we're going to start off with one that came in later. It said, great presentation. Thank you. You suggest that credit schemes offer long-term opportunities to generate investment and generate new benefits for the communities. However, while I see carbon credits continually being generated, if changing over time as an ecosystem matures, isn't there an upper limit to how biodiverse an ecosystem can be? Therefore, isn't there the possibility that a particular MPA might generate the bulk of its credits early on and then need to be maintained to retain the value of the credits that were generated. I think I follow the question there. And that is, yes, absolutely a very good point. Uh, I don't think we are at that stage in, in any MPA. And wouldn't it be great if we actually did get to that stage? If we were, it would take decades. I think even with the most well-managed MPA, there are always problems. Um, so I think it's it's a theoretical limit, of course. So I don't think any economist would say that finance streams are, um, you know, are infinite. But it's a very good point. And yes, I, I do agree. At some point, there will be a, a tailing off, if you like, of, the, of the, the quantum of benefits that could be generated. But given we're talking about decades, I think there'll be new problems to consider by the time that we get to that point. Okay, good point. All right. Thank you, Julian. Um, another question, with regards to the methodology used, do you have any recommendations on solid ones for marine ecosystems, or are you aware of any being developed? The one put together by Open Earth seems to be a great one, but does not have a real-life application just yet. Very few do, given that very few marine ecosystems are the focus of, of, of biodiversity credit projects. From, from memory, the Wallacea Trust um, um, methodologies employed by Replanet, uh, Replanet, so R-E-P-L-A-N-E-T, and they have a mangrove restoration scheme, a mangrove biodiversity credit scheme operating in Honduras. Um, the supposed advantage of the Wallacea Trust methodology, sorry, is that the choice of biodiversity indicators is suited to the local context. So the unit increase in biodiversity is relevant to the local ecosystems. This argument of discussion over which metric is, is the best or, or most appropriate will continue and will not be. I honestly do not think it will be resolved, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe we should not be thinking about the need to trade across biodiversity credit schemes 
in the way that we trade carbon credits internationally, I think there's a lot of feeling in the biodiversity credit world that there have been significant mistakes made in terms of in the voluntary carbon market, in terms of some of the schemes are not delivering what they should. There's a bit of greenwashing going on in some. And we need to be very careful about making sure that we are doing what we, we say we will when it comes to biodiversity. I think part of that is actually recognizing that biodiversity is a complex concept and it will be need, sorry, to be measured in, in different ways. I think that addresses the question. I, I might have started rambling there, Sarah, sorry. No, no, I think you got it. All right. Thank you, Julian. Um, speaking of greenwashing, there was a question do you have an opinion on plastic credits and linking those to MPA management? We are nervous about these in their current sense and impacts on communities, biodiversity, and also lack of regulation, monitoring, and greenwashing. I would be very wary of anything that has not got adequate systems of monitoring, reporting, and verification. To, to be absolutely frank with you. So yes, if if there is a a scheme being set up which is not independently audited, for example, or does not conform to some internationally accepted standards, which is unlikely, there aren't many, then, I, yeah, I, I would agree with you absolutely. And if there's a, a did you say a plastic credit scheme? Plastic um, credits. I assume that's basically involving recycling and getting... Uh, it's difficult to answer that without the specifics, but with the experience of the, not just greenwashing in this context, but in others, independent auditing and verification is fundamental. Thank you, Julian. Um, another question, I was wondering how Julian perceives the risk of additionality for credits generated within an MPA. Uh, for example, do you think it is important to be able to demonstrate that additional positive activities are taking place due to the sale of these credits? Additional positive activities? Yes, that's what it said. Uh, additionality is the um, enhancement of biodiversity that would not otherwise occur. So additionality is fundamental to any, any project. If you don't have demonstrate additionality, then then you lead into greenwashing. And I think people are referencing some of those on the, on the chat. Uh, so what was, sorry, was the question, do I agree that it, it, additionality is necessary? Apologies, I'm, I'm trying to see the, the question. Sorry, uh, it's now in the answer column. I, I moved over there. Um, it was, I was wondering how Julian perceives the risk of additionality for credits within generated within an MPA. Uh, for example, do you think it is important to be able to demonstrate that additional positive activities are taking place through the sale of these credits? So I don't know that. Oh, sorry, I, I, see, I, see the, I see the question. Okay. So that, that reflects the use to which the, the sales of the credits are put. Yes, absolutely. Uh, additionality may or may not be the right word, but that I think reflects the points I, I was making with regards to ensuring that we have fundamental principles around which credit schemes are built. However, I think the issue is if we are talking about new income streams being generated and revenues then being distributed to recipient communities or individuals how they use that money is another matter um if you were i if you were some all-powerful deity and you were doing this from the outset i think you could perhaps set up a scheme which ensured that a certain proportion of those benefits went to community level initiatives and a certain proportion went to individuals and balance it out that way so that you knew that at least some proportion of the money was reaching all sectors of the local community and in common things like health education uh, infrastructure possibly but clearly that's double-edged but i think if you ensure that there are community level social benefits that would not happen without the credit scheme being present, then that would be a, a pretty good definition of additionality for that. Thank you, Julian. 
Um, can you give any examples of blue carbon success stories where indigenous peoples and local communities have been fairly involved with carbon and bi biodiversity credit schemes and management processes? There are very, very few. Off the top of my head, no, um, for various reasons. There are a limited number of blue carbon schemes around the world anyway. And I'm not saying this is, this is just my impression. But if I was a scheme developer, I would look for a location with minimal conflicts over resource claims and tenure. If I was starting out in this market. So it's perhaps inevitable that the early blue carbon schemes would probably not take place where there may be conflicts over land use. However, I know in Australia, where you have established tenure claims that have been settled, which include both land and sea country, traditional owners in that context are very interested in developing their own carbon or biodiversity credit schemes because tenure claims are, are not a point of contestation anymore. So I think you will naturally see a greater involvement, but it would be it will be very interesting to see to what extent indigenous peoples and local communities take ownership of that process and that's a, a very necessary point for the credit scheme sorry for the credit ecosystem to to mature okay thank you julian um there's several questions that have come up regarding some minimum size and i'll, I'll read a couple of them does the size of an MPA impact its ability to enter the blue carbon or biodiversity market? And another one was, given the cost of setup and ongoing management, are carbon credit schemes practical for small indigenous communities that might have a locally managed marine protected area? It, very good question. I think as the, both the carbon and biodiversity credit markets evolve i think we could be looking at i'm not saying niche in a negative sense but credits which emanate from specific types of contexts could attract different prices so if you're working in an lmma for example where there is naturally a, a close involvement of community in management then any credits arising out of that particular M sorry I'll stop waving out of that LMMA would potentially attract a higher price and so when it comes to thinking about is there a minimum size I don't actually think it's the size of the location that is important it's can you uh, add value extra value to the credits given the nature of where they come from and I, I could imagine different corporate investors or purchasers being very keen to be seen to fund LMMAs, resident communities in that context and actually pay more for the credits for, to, to, to be perceived as supporting those types of ecosystems and communities. Okay. All right. Thank you, Julian. Um, I'm going to read one comment from Stephen Lutz, and uh, he was saying the blue carbon markets in Kenya are regarded as high um, for community involvement. Google Mikoko Pomoja, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Vanga Blue Forest. So that um, two to look at for. Thank you. Um, yeah. People are interested. Um, let's see. Another question. Um, you mentioned that without community involvement, conservation efforts cannot succeed. However, we know that in some cases of MPAs, even when managers work with communities, it doesn't mean that these communities are included in all decisions, activities, et cetera. And sometimes they may even oppose the efforts as seen with the defensive stance of some fishers. So from the private sector's perspective, how can we ensure that their investment will meet the needs of the communities? It depends on how the scheme is set up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There will be individuals who oppose um, conservation measures. I, I think I was being a bit flippant when I said that about um, 
has to involve local. That's just my prejudices. Um, but absolutely, if the scheme is set up, acknowledging that not everyone need participate, you can't force people to become involved, yet the benefits of any such scheme reach across the community re re uh, irrespective of that, then I think you have room for people who don't wish to be involved or don't feel it's appropriate for their community to 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 go down that way. You'll never have unanimity. And I think we really should accept that. However, if you have a situation where an MPA, an MPA authority manager can act as that, that honest broker and is held in that regard by the community's beforehand, then I think you stand a, a better chance of getting a, a majority consensus. And I think that's all you need. I think that's all we should realistically ever aim for in conservation is a majority consensus that is a good thing overall, or it's worth investing in and, and seeing if it works. It also depends on, I would imagine, the viability of other income streams, alternative livelihoods and so on, and whether the you know, a credit scheme actually has sufficient attraction. And, th and that will clearly be locally variable. And I think the, I noticed in the comments, yeah, the, there have been articles, particularly in The Guardian, a couple of other newspapers, that um, terrestrial carbon credit schemes are, are not working as they should. I think my own opinions on those are, probably neither here nor there. I think we always have to prove beyond reasonable doubt that a credit scheme is working. And that comes back to the monitoring, reporting and verification processes. Okay, thank you, Julian. Um, we have a lot more great questions that we're not gonna be able to get, get to, but I will provide those to Julian for everyone who sent them in. Um, so he'll be able to see those. Um, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. Lots of kudos in the in the comments. Um, and we really appreciate you being on to do this. And uh, we'd love to have you back on today to, to talk more on this topic. Thank Lots you very much. Sorry. Th thank you, Sarah. And, yeah. and thanks. Sorry, I've just got a new headset here. Thanks, everyone. I uh, hope you found it enjoyable. Um, my email address was on the first slide. If you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to drop me a line. I'm more than happy to chat. But thanks for thanks for listening. And um, would you mind, would you just want to flip back to the um, first slides and people can get a look at that before we? Yep. We Oops, sorry, I'll have to go all the way through. That's all right. In the animations and everything. Da, 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 da. There. I should have copied and pasted it. Oh, there we go. Okay, jclifton at lincoln.ac.uk. Okay, great. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and we hope to see you in a future webinar. Okay. Love to. Bye, guys. Thanks again.